Hello, guys and gals, and we will be reading an odd beastery, or a compendium of instructive and entertaining descriptions of animals culled from five centuries of travelers' accounts, natural histories, zoologies, etc., by authors famous and obscure, arranged as an abyssidiary. And abyssidiary is taken from abyss... Abyssarium, which is basically alphabetic, going by the alphabet. This was um, designed and illustrated by Alan James Robinson, and the text is compiled and noted by Laurie Block. We're going to go over the copyright information. The, inf the interesting thing about this book is the writing is only on one side of the paper. Um, except for right here says right here, University of Illinois Press, 1986, published a special arrangement by Chelonide Press, copyright 1982 by Chelonide Press, manufactured in the United States of America. This book is printed on acid-free paper. And then the Library of Congress information is there, but it doesn't say anything about not doing this. And it says this is for Joel Ginsburg, or Ginsburg. Introduction. Introduction. Drawn from five centuries of travelers' accounts, an, an odd besti bestiary is the story of a transform transformation of vision, the story of how men came to view the animate world as reality with its own unique history, integrity, and order. It begins in the Middle Ages when men saw... All living things as symbols, moral allegories of the feudal hierarchy. God reigned supreme over angels, angels over the stars, the stars over men, men over Noah's ark. There were people who ventured out and glimpsed what life was like beyond the stone walls surrounding the medieval community. And when these travelers returned home, they brought word of an earth so large, so full of splendor, so remote from the experience of those at home that their tales altered the people's dreams. There were continents and oceans to the to be discovered. It had been said that said that zoology begins with travel. The book of beast or bestiary had its heyday in the late twelfth and early thirteenth centuries, or so it seemed from the manuscripts still extant. Even then it was an ancient book, for its origins reached back seven hundred years to the text. To a text the Latins nicknamed the Physio, Physio, Physiogus. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Physio, Physiogus, compiled at some point between the second and fifth centuries by the or by an anonymous monk, the the physiologus physio physio contained stories of 25 to 50 creatures. These stories de derived from the church fathers and their commentators who were looking back yet again, yet another 700 years to the Greek writers Herodotus, Aristotle, and Pliny. The Christians borrowed heavily, but they gave the pagan material they they inherited a religious and moral twist that endured unquestioned unquestioned for a millennium. The medieval readers thought the beast the bestiary a religious text and accepted its observations and connections as sacred. Thus, the lion, the king of beasts, a wild creature accustomed to freedom by nature wandered wherever he desired, if pursued by hunters, would disguise his spore by rubbing it out with the tuft of his tail, in the same way the Savior hid from the devil who dared to pursue him with temptations. In its zigzag centuries-long migration over language barriers, geographic boundaries, monastic and secular traditions, the bestiary grew by 
accretion. So much material was absorbed that one group of 13th century manuscripts included some 200 creatures. Such texts were jigsaw puzzle pictures of, an, of the animate world. Their pieces were cut and glued together from scrabble, scrambled bits of hunting lore, traveler, traveler tales, mythology, etymology, theology, and artists' fancies. The task of deciphering the bestiary's animal kingdom, visualizing the animal it described, were complicated beyond belief, for many of these creatures could not possibly ha could not be, be seen by monks living in northern Europe. Yet the very common bestiary technique of portraying rare and exotic creatures by mixing the parts of familiar ones was often quite successful. Pilgrims who visited the Holy Land in the 14th century certainly knew what camels looked like, and perhaps they had seen a caged leopard or its skin on display in Alexander or in Alexandria or Rome. With this experience in memory, within memory's range, it wasn't so difficult to imagine the camel leopard, a long-necked animal with a head of a camel and spots like a leopard, and impressionistic giraffe, unraveling the identity of the creature's mixed mix of parts were the result of linguistic confusion offered more oh, offered more 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 engaging challenges to medieval scholars. A mere spelling error by a scribe could result in the creation of an entirely new species, which was then inspired which then inspired rapid flights of etym etymological imagination. More amazing than the fabulous figures who crept into the besti bestiary's pages is the number of European, African, and Asian animals that contained some 90% of the creatures they describe inhabit our planet. 13th century cartographers who pictured famous sites and and towns, flora and fauna, as well as geogra geography on their world maps, used the bestiaries as one of their guides. When they pictured the camelopard, antelope, ostrich, rhinoceros, hyena, monkey, or crocodile, each in its proper ge geographic range, in the millennium, when human memory was the greatest storehouse of information, it would seem more Probable, probable that animals living thousands of miles away from Europe's monasteries would vanish from the record. That the bestiary's mosaic base retained so much unverifiable but real zo zoolog zo zoological data is a tribute to those who worked in the great piece of the Abbey Library studying what could be called the Allegorical Code. The heavy carved doors that kept the Age of Faith, a cloistered world, open by 15, yeah, 1500, the, Vol the Vulgate Bible had been printed 94 times. Noblemen and their stewards could read and write. Education was in secular hands, the libraries had been moved from the abbeys to the universities. Copernicus enlarged the heavens, Columbus the earth itself. Scholars who fled west at the fall of Constantinople in 1453 brought with them the great works of the classical world, translated into Latin from Greek and Arabic. Arabic, rather. The ancients were resurrected from obscurity. The true antiquity of civilization could be recognized. Aristotle, Aristotle, Plato, Ptolemy, Galen, and Euripides, as well as numerous modern Erasmus, Martin Luther, Dante, and Boccaccio, were being published in what was then staggering numbers. 200 books of printing was not uncommon. The perspective, the perspective gained in the Renaissance cast a harsh light upon the, 
on the medieval scholar's credibility. Imaginations dazzled, a, hor a horizon line of the mind was crossed. On the shores of the new world, a solitary soldier upon a steed, both half-starved, rode up and down a sandy beach. The horseman terrorized the centuries serving Montezuma's nation. Cortez grasped the power of the centaur. It is this moment when the number of animal families known to be in God's creation increased with each ge geographic discovery, when men could begin to see the dubious pilgrimage of John Mandeville Griffin to the Holy Land and the remarkable adventures of Marco Polo, rhinoceros, from which they really were, and the texts selected for an odd bestiary found their first audience. When Richard Eden, elephant, and his El Elizabethan counterparts, or her contemporaries rather, were studying at Cambridge, such a flood of information was pouring in that men were visibly accelerating their speed as the, the speed of thought. The newly invented compass directed that thought around the globe, it became Eden's object to make what the Portuguese and Spaniards had done known known to, to his fellow, fellow countrymen. To achieve this aim, Eden displayed a rarely precedented degree of independence from established authority, citing, citing printing and gunpowder as evidence he exclaimed in favor of his own time. This, this our age, may seem not, want, not only to contend with the on, on, on centies, but also a many goodly inventions in the art of, of white art and white fair to exceed them. I'm having trouble reading this. He challenged the doctrine that the uncenities had comprehended all things and helped pioneer the cause of critical thinking, knowledge he believed should be made accessible to as many souls as possible. The dissemination of information was for the public good. The vehicle best able to serve this novel principle was vernacular English prose. Although not an original writer, Eden was a translator of vision. Many of his contemporaries thought Latin to be the superior, the, the superior certain, the serious tongue. When they wanted to express their best thoughts and ideas, they spoke and wrote in this international means of communication. To their ears, English was a crude language, utterly barren of eloquence, ephemeral at best. The debate over language, Latin versus English, which, be, which begins with Eden and a few like-minded individuals, and the debate over authority, ancient versus modern, would gain in intensity and continue throughout the 17th century and beyond. In England, it was known as Battle of the Books. In the, mi in the mist, in its midst, Fran Francis Bacon, William Gilbert, Robert Boyle, and John Spratt advanced the search for method, which led to the foundation of modern science. I just have to say, though, that having a name like Francis Bacon would make me hungry all the time. In 1600, Englishmen were more than half medieval, but by the century's end, they were more than half modern. Between 1500 and 1630, the annual production of books in England increased from about 45 to 400, 460. Each increase in book production was matched by an enlargement of the reading public, which now included many persons who, lacking a classical education, embraced vernacular English literature. Um, publication, for, publication for the King James Bible, 1611, 
satisfied their religious needs. For the classics, they were well served by translators like Philemon Holland, um, Xiphus, and Unicorn, who rendered Pliny, Plutarch, and Z Xenophon into a chaste English prose that contained both colloquial energy and metaphoric color. To quench their thirst for knowledge, the novelty, oh, and novelty, they turned to compendia like Edward Topsell's Ibex, immense po immensely popular history of four-footed beasts, a translation of Conrad Gessner's great Latin opus. Unlike Eden, Topsell allied himself with the pro-ancient faction in the Battle of the Books, taking his cue from Gessner, who had modeled his work after the medieval encyclopedia encyclopedists. Topsell's compilation is an uncritical collection of all the material found in the works of the established authorities. Compared with the medieval bestiary, Topsell's history greatly multiplied the number of purely fabulous creatures in the world's zoos. Furthermore, Top Cell, like Gessner, showed no recognition of the connection between different living things. This suggested that Top Cell gave little critical attention to obs observable to the observable world around him. The little and little direct attention to the accounts of rare and exotic animals seen by travelers. Geographers, on the other hand, had been comparing the voyages, the voyagers' accounts with the ancients, with the ancients' texts, for a for a century. The comparative approach, along with revolutionary Im improvements in cartography, yielded a much corrected picture of the world and. And though the tradition of portraying characteristic animals and plants different of different geo geographic regions was declining, the increasingly recognizable images of the giraffe and hippopotamus and the inclusion of many new creatures, the armadillo, llama, polar bear, and zebra, in territories previously considered terra incognita, are convincing evidence that the geographers and cartographers' allegiance to the moderns. Since the Middle Ages, multitudes of pilgrims, clerics, scholars, merchants, diplomats, and soldiers had surmounted the difficulties and dangers of travel. During the 16th and 17th centuries, guidebooks advocating how to get the most from one's foreign adventures and the best way to share those experiences with others were frequently published. As were many, as were numerous relations, in quotes, the narrative accounts of people's journeys in Protestant England, only books of sermons rival sermons rivaled the popularity of these much loved, much read, extremely diverse vernacular genre. The account of Thomas Herbert, Dodo, and Adam. Oliarius Jeroboa belonged to the period when, belonged to the period when going on a diplomatic mission it was thought to be the best education and training for young men interested in public service. But reading with but, but reading but readers with or without worldly ambitions were avid fans of the New World drama. The lively narratives of Captain John Smith. Sir Walter Raleigh, Sir Richard Hawkins, Flying Fish, Sir Francis Drake, and John Esquim Esquimel Esquimeling, Manatee, captured even Shakespeare's and King James' attention. Filled with stories about Indi Indian con colonists, struggling uh, struggle struggles, pirates, battles with the Spanish, exotic animals, tropical plants, marine mysteries, and mishaps, no matter how the voyage, voyagers veiled reality with allegorical Christian versions of a misty paradise discovered, their accounts were never dull. Their, oh, their accounts are never, never dull.
had to add that extra never. By the 1940s, many of the voyagers wrote in cooperation with the needs of the new national philosophers, not yet called scientists. Among the first acts, the Royal Society, founded in, in 1662, published a new type of periodic, the Scientific Journal. In the first two years of the, of the philosophical transcriptions, monthly issues, 12 programs of worldwide research to be carried out by travelers were outlined. They were then translated into Latin and distributed throughout Europe. These programs provided how-to instructions for gathering information about things like the position of constellations, tropical wind currents, depth and degree of sal salinity in the world's oceans, the longitude and latitude of, of simply everything. Oh, and, oh, yeah, of simply everything. Studies of distant lands, peoples, plants, and animals were considered e equally important. Many voyagers in enthusiastically compiled, oh, complied with the society's schemes, and the society responded by publishing their reports. Walter Dampier, Dampier Sloth is perhaps the best, the best Emplar of the society's ideals, both in his observant, his observational and literary, literary style, in the preface of, of his book, New Voyages, Dampier explains, my chief care, hath been, to be as particular as was consistent with my intended brevity in setting down such observables, as I met with. He claimed, that. Though he had chosen to be more particular than needful, it can be hard. It can hardly be. It can hardly be. But there will be some now. Now, okay. Light afforded to this. Dampier brings the reader remarkably close to the very thing which he describes. His prose is impersonal, objective laconic, and true to the actual world, something readers in his day had rarely encountered before. The traveler's attempts at describing strange animals' new additions to God's creation illustrate how difficult their accomplishments were. There were simply no models for objective obser observing in describing the appearance, character, or behavior of real creatures living in the world. The standard vocabularies for anatomy, chemistry, and psychology, oh, physiology, rather, sorry, were not yet part of the English language. Concepts for classification were embryonic. No notions about evolution and the distribution of species more than a century away from conception. As a group of travelers produced a good deal of plain, lively prose. After all, they were plain men, guided largely by utilitarian arms, to make clear what they saw or thought they saw to the folks back home. They, like the, they, like the medieval bestiary writers, often mixed the parts of familiar creatures to describe the unfamiliar. The dodo, like the swan in, in bigness, for shape and rareness, rivals the phoenix of Arabia. The manatee is the color of a land cow, but tastes like pork. The sloth is like an ant bear, but not as rough. But the jigsaw, the jigsaw composition of the medieval bestiaries were the final Christianized form of a message that had been passed from one person to the next in a millennium-long game of telephone. The jigsawed components, um, composi compositions, rather, of the travelers were joyful, new were joyful news. They were the beginning of the attempt to recognize the world which exists outside of ourselves. The integrity of creatures, oh, the, yeah, integrity of creatures other than human, and the respect, and the respect that otherness demands, an attitude without which 20th century zoology is inconceivable. To our ears, the result of the traveler's efforts sound like verbal 
caricatures, but to appreciate their down-to-earth influence, we need only compare the style of the acrobatics of Sir Thomas Brown, unicorn, among scholars and scientists, Brown's intimate, intimate, uh, inimitable skepticism advance the modern cause of critical thinking, but the travelers who grasp at who grasp at the sights before their eye, their very eyes, and convey the experience of direct observation in a fresh, entertaining, accessible way, did more to in emancipate the ordinary educated man from the allegorical code. Their accounts enlarged the known world by enlarging the world of actual knowledge. In the 18th century, men like Sir Joseph Banks, kangaroo, carried on the expanded, oh, carried on and expanded the Royal Society's interest in natural history. But as the quantity of information increased, the time advanced the time advanced. English biological scientists had difficulty keeping the lines of religious knowledge distinct from knowledge derived from the observable natural world. Men stationed at the outpost of civilization, especially those with general interests, David Columns, Platypus, in Australia, in Australia, and Captain John Steadman, Vampire Bat, in Suriname, were little inclined to fall into academic argument over natural theology, but the glory of God's work could be seen throughout the narratives by the century's end. The work of blazing the theor theoretical path to modern zoology has fallen to the French with the brilliant Comte de Buffon, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, zebra, pointing the way, but Though, but oh, yeah, but though they had lost preeminence, the British were not idle. Eric Idle, just kidding. The, surve the surveyors, explorers, and administrators sent to the far ends of the British Empire: William Scoresby, Walrus; James, James Tennant, Loris; Samuel Tur uh, Turner, Yak. Continually sent word of the planet's newly revealed mysteries home to legions of natural historians who were busy cataloging, classifying, and describing, according to the rules of taxonomy, everything on Earth. On December 7th, 1831, HMS Beagle set out of Plymouth her objective to extend the survey of South America. The British had begun in 1826. She was considered a well-fitted ship, yet Charles Darwin, tortoise, lacked many of the basic tools of his profession. A compound microscope, for example. For the next five years, his home would be a narrow space at the end of a ship's chart, chart room, an area so small Darwin wrote to his family that, he, that when he hung his hammock at night, he had to remove the locker to keep his clothes in. Oh, he kept his clothes in to make room for the foot clues. On October 6, 1838, the Beagle returned to England in a sense. Darwin's voyage was the culmination of centuries of travel accounts, for he saw all that the men who had preceded him had seen and more. Darwin would spend the rest of his life meditating on his experiences, on his experience rather, and we have spent more than a century exploring the meaning and implication of his meditations by Laura Block. Note, with the exception of the long S changed to the modern form, the, substitute, the substitution of J for V and the I for U, where you would so pronou pronounce the minor change in punctuation for readability, the text chosen for the old bestiary has not been altered from the original form. We are going to have to, we will start this up, and we will start with, when we pick this up, We'll start with Armadillo. We've been reading An Odd Bestiary by Alan James Robinson and Laura Block. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe, ring the bell so you know when I upload, and if you support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.